I wanted to start by saying that I think that one of the most complicated things for a lot of people, disabled and abled, and people who are in the middle, you know, in the liminal space, around disability is looking at questions of disability and health. Because um, though it's not often articulated, like as disabled people, underneath all of the like, oh yeah, you know, you're doing so good. Like we're profoundly people who trouble ideas of what health is. And as somebody who's an autistic 44 year old, chronically ill, disabled, crunchy spine person, I am like many, many other disabled people, a profoundly, according to the medical industrial complex, unhealthy person, right? According to all their rules and standards of what health is and what normal is. And the fact that, I, and I guess that would lead me to the fact that like, I don't really focus a lot on health in those ways. I'm focused on really taking an intersectional, disabled, feminist of color, working class approach that says, I don't really give a shit about those kind of traditional qualifiers or ways of measuring health. My idea of health is more, how do I, how am I? How am I, along with other disabled people, especially disabled people who are also queer and trans, who are also black and brown, living really good lives as disabled people, right? And this is one of those things where people, sometimes people are like, mm, what do you mean by that? And it's kind of like, I was saying earlier, I'm like, it's like being red pill, being brought into disability culture, but not the way like people who are fascists mean it. It's like, it's really hard to get it across until you actually get disabled and maybe it sticks around for a while and you're like, wow, my life isn't an able-bodied person's, but it really doesn't suck. And there's all of these secret disabled skills and knowledges and wisdoms and community building and innovation that are incredible that I really kind of feel sorry for the able-bodied because they don't get to experience it. No, really. Um, and some of those are ways that as disabled people, particularly as mostly marginalized disabled people, when we have the luck and the good fortune to build homes and communities with each other, it's about the ways we reach to each other and support each other and save each other's lives, much more than doctors do most of the time. And it's also through things that the medical industrial complex never looks at when it measures vectors of health, like activism, right? Like disabled, like radical queer brown activism is something that helps my quality of life much more than most things that my doctor will never give me. Um, so I wanted to kind of start from there, and I have some definitions, and I also have some pretty pictures. Um, and I wanted to tell disabled femme of color stories, disabled people of color stories, because disability is everywhere. It's in the tap water. Um, you know, you can look at any moment in human history, and there's disability in it. But it's we're both as disabled people so hyper visible and so invisibilized at the same time. We are both people who are so used to being stared at and examined and questioned and policed about whether we're really disabled or not. And we're so used to people not being able to witness our disabled lives in their full form. So I could lecture a lot or I could tell stories. I'm gonna tell some stories. Um, so I want to start with this image of my comrade, Carrie Ann Lucas, who, does anyone know Carrie Ann Lucas's life and work here this year? Great, yeah, two people. Okay, cool, I'm gonna tell the rest of you now. So. Carrie Ann Lucas was a fat, femme, Latinx, queer mother, lawyer, activist, and warrior. Um, she, we, I could do a whole lecture just on her. Um, she grew up in Colorado her whole life. Um, she did so many things. Um, one of the places I'm gonna start are, I'll tell two stories about her. One um, is the story of when she went to adopt her first child. She adopted and parented four kids with significant disabilities and got them out of foster care into a beautiful, loving, disabled queer home. And the first time she tried it, they told her, we don't let disabled people, particularly disabled people of color, particularly disabled single moms adopt kids. Um, she went to law school, um, became a lawyer, and then created the law in Colorado that defends the rights of disabled and deaf people to parent against ableism. Um, and then there's the story of, and I'm sharing this, and I want to say this is not like, oh my God, that's so inspirational in that kind of way. I want you to take away that these are stories of disabled power, right? Because we don't get that a lot. We get to be seen as the poor cripples or the super crips. Um, so there's this wonderful story two years ago where with a long, along with a lot of other disabled folks, she was part of a 58 hour all disabled sit in in Senator Cory Gardner's Denver office to, which is, was part of, you know, was one small part of actions by disabled people all over the country, which are the reason why we still have the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid. Like thank, thank disabled people for that. Like this is why, this is why we have it. 
Um, she, was for, she was there for 58 hours. Um, her arrest was live streamed to thousands of people on Facebook. And um, she, and I share this because so often as disabled people, as people who are contemplating disability, the way we know how to experience our body is as weak, as broken, as a failure, not as a tool. Um, Carrie Ann will be remembered for using her body, her fat, queer, disabled body, as a barricade. Because what happened was, as she said in her own words, um, while I would not resist arrest, I was not willing to help the police officers learn how to operate my wheelchair. <laughs> Due to my disability, I have adaptive controls for my chair and I don't use a traditional joystick. The adaptive control is either Velcro to my tray or held in my hand. It is easily broken and impossible for someone else to use. My control was sitting in my lap the whole time, but because it just looks like a button on a wire, they couldn't figure out what it was. I told them that they could Google it if they wanted to look it up. Rather than simply disengaging the motors to push the chair, they spent a great deal of time trying to find a joystick. They kept moving my ventilator tubing around. In their search for a non-existent joystick, they disconnect the display where I can see what mode the chair is in, which renders the chair completely inoperable. Um, I could go on. So she resisted arrest using her adaptive equipment and her disabled knowledge. And she used her body as a weapon. Um, this is just one example. One thing I really want people to take away from this, you know, teachable moment that I'm here is that as disabled people, particularly as black, brown, working class, queer, trans, multiply marginalized people, so often in the words of disabled Korean activist Mia Mingus, she has this line that I go back to over and over again that you might have heard where she says over and over again, I meet other disabled women of color who don't identify as disabled, even though they absolutely have that lived experience. And she says, this is because it can be very dangerous to identify as something when your life depends on you denying it, right? And what all of us who founded this movement called Disability Justice 15 years ago are doing is coming from that place where we're like, yes, so many of our ancestors have survived by faking it and passing and being like, nope, we're good. And that's been a really smart survival strategy. And it's also left us with a lot of scars where we don't know, it doesn't leave room for us to dig in and find the disabled strengths we have. Right, But some of the ways that we combat that is by telling and sharing and finding and reaching the disabled stories in our communities and reaching back and finding our disabled ancestors. And as a mixed race person of color, I absolutely move in a queer of color tradition that is about finding our lineages and knowing we come from somewhere. And I think it is absolutely beautiful and vital and health giving for me to find my disabled ancestors and to honor them and to figure out how I'm gonna add to their tradition. Y'all still with me? Cool, okay, great. <laughs> Cool. Um, I'm premenstrual, and I'm just like, you know, I could, like, there's a lot of Star Trek to watch at home, so I'm just like, <laughs> bring the energy if it's good. Um, I wanted to give a few examples of recent disabled activism. This is an action that um, some dear friends of mine in the Bay Area, California, did um, really recently called Baddies and Crips Close the Camps. Um, so for people who can't see, there's an image to the right of a bunch of different people. Some are wheelchair users, a lot are elders, some are white, some are brown. And there's, you can't see what they're sitting in front of, but they're holding signs that say words like wanted, valuable, irreplaceable, important, integral, kin, right? This action was part of a 30-day action where different groups protested in front of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office every day for August in protest of the concentration camps that are currently operating on the southern border of the United States and throughout the United States. And I know that for me, as someone living in Seattle who has been really, like a lot of us, just in a state of just shock and horror. And I've also felt like, wow, I'm really, I can come up with some really great activist ideas. I don't know how to stop this one. You know, I can send 20 bucks to races all I want and I can try and vote them out. And like direct action to stop this stuff when it's still militarized feels so tough. And it's really hard to organize when you are coming from a place of feeling powerless. Um, there's a line in the movie that came out last year, Sorry to Bother You, where the character says, you know, unless you give people a way to fight something that's gonna work, they don't try and fight it, they just figure out how to get used to it, mm -hmm. right? So I wanna talk about the, the what of this organizing and I wanna talk about the how. Um, I think, you know, from talking with folks, because I got really head up and I was like, I'm gonna do something in Seattle, but it was like four days later and they were like, that's not accessible, just, just calm down, you can, do, you can protest it in a month. We were talking and they were like, yeah, um, there's some things that are really important about the way this was organized. First of all, like we were looking at how, what power we had and how we could build power with each other, 
right? And they're like, we can't necessarily go to the border and tear down the walls without getting shot, but what we can do is we can come together as disabled, fat, and elder folks, folks who have experiences of being told our bodies are disposable and not worthy, and folks who also often have experiences of being locked up. Okay, there's a really cool picture that I want to show up, and it's not there, but I can show it to you later. Basically, um, people, because disabled people really like the internet, and it's an access tool for us, and we like Instagram sometimes, right? Um, the folks who organized this, they did a hell of a job getting 200 people who are like old wheelchair users, people who are facing multiple access barriers to being there out. And they also were like, we understand you might wake up and be throwing up that day. It's fine. We get it. So they were like, they were asking people to also post under the hashtag Crips and Fatties Close the Camps or like Nobody is Disposable and to post pictures of ourselves telling our stories of what we know about disposability and incarceration and institutionalization. And I want to shout out my friend and comrade Elliot Fuqui, who's actually from Central Ohio, is a disabled mixed race Asian trans guy who's like, yeah, I was in youth foster care and institutionalized in youth psych wards here. I know what it's like to be locked up. There's a lot of connections that as disabled people we have where, we, where we're locked up might be prisons or immigration facilities or jails. It might also be fat camp, the psych ward, inpatient, et cetera, nursing homes, or just the societal pressure to lock us away to a place where we're not seen. And there are really potent connections when we can come together and build on those things and like work to build power with each other. So I'm gonna like backtrack and say that like I wanted to Give that as an example of a couple of examples of like vital, potent places that disabled folks come together. Um, I have to admit, around five days ago, I was just like, disabled feminism, shit. Uh, am I gonna have to do the 101? Like, women are disabled, right? And then I was like, no, no, I don't have to do that because that's not the kind of feminist I am. So why would I do that? And like, I don't think you guys want that anyway. Um, but I want to, I want to continue to share stories of disabled community building, disabled activism, and disabled power. And some of the different, because I, I think it's really important to talk about both the really hard things we're dealing with and also spaces of power and connection. I get what's happening and there's nothing we can do about it. It's doing that weird thing where occasionally PowerPoints will be like, this one is skipped for no reason. So I can email anyone the whole thing later. I know that you're dying for another PowerPoint because you're college students, some of you, but like, if you want to, this is the good shit. Um, Briefly, I want to give some examples, and then I'm going to wrap up by reading from an essay that is going to be coming out soon that's not published yet that's about dreaming disability justice dreams during the end of the world. Really quick, I want to say you've got, as examples of coming together, you've got the La Spoonie Collective or LA Spoonie Collective, which is, for people who don't know, a Spoonie is slang for somebody who's chronically ill who doesn't have a lot of energy because there's an article called The Spoon Theory that talks about how as disabled people, they basically use spoons as a metaphor for having a limited amount of energy. It, you can Google it, you'll figure it out. But this is, I mean, this is, I mean, it's an Instagram profile. It's also a crew of like, youngish, you know, weird, queer, slash feminist, slash of color, disabled folks who are like, yeah, we get together and we make dinner for each other and we look out for each other's medication needs and we're tired together in public and we share information and we go and do medical accompaniment with each other. And we also do memes around ableism and have gatherings and do cultural work. And I really like the concept of things you can do, and I'm just like, yeah, not everything, not only is a 20 mile march really inaccessible, it is not the only form of activism. These are things we can do. You've got the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, right, kind of right across the border. Well, these are like three young disabled women of color who are all like under 22, who are like, yeah, we're just gonna start a provincial wide network and really crip the vote and like bring disability issues of black and brown and indigenous people into the voting that's happening in Canada right now. Um, You've got somebody like the Autism Self-Advocacy Network, which, um, fun fact, as I'm gonna come out as an autistic person of color, I think I already did that, but anyway. Um, you know, a lot of people still think that everyone who's on the spectrum is like a white guy, and there are a lot of white guys in the spectrum, but there's also a lot of the rest of us, which so is fun fact. Um, and what a lot of people also don't know is that Autism Speaks, which is the number one well-known organization, is made up almost entirely of people who aren't autistic and um, are pretty much hated by most of us who are autistic. Um, autistic Self Advocacy Network is a North American wide group of autistic people who working as autistic people. They created this safety tip guide, which is a zine, which is about like self care and taking care of yourself in abusive situations. But it's also a guide for surviving encounters with the police, right? Because as we know, 50% of people who are killed by the police are disabled in some way. It's not talked about, but it's another one of those places where disability is up in everything. 
And sorry, I feel like I keep being like, and bringing it back to the theme. And I'm like, so when we talk about health, I feel like we're really missing a lot when we don't include police and state murder of disabled people, particularly disabled people of color, in our ideas of what health are. And when there's currently so many different statutes that are being proposed in the books that are like, oh, the solution to this is to do an autism registry. Have you heard about this? Yeah, they're like, so the solution, the way to stop cops from killing autistic people is like, we'll just have a registry where if you're autistic, you register with the police, they'll know you're autistic and they won't shoot you. This is not going to work, and I don't really want the cops to know the name and address of me and every other autistic person in my neighborhood. This does not sound like a good idea for me. I'm a prison abolitionist and somebody who's worked in transformative justice work, trying to create solutions to violence and harm without primarily relying on state systems for 20 years. And I often get asked, well, shouldn't we do a training for the police to make them understand disability? And my answer is like, I've been around for 25 years and it's been tried a lot and it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid over gangrene. It doesn't work. Um, what does work is demilitarizing the police. What does work is building community connections where as autistic and neurodiverse people, we can find each other and love each other and our weird faces and figure out and share our life hacks and support each other and not be isolated, alone, and unsupported, right? Thank you for the nods. I'm like, um, and last but not least, um, something that I've been talking about a lot lately um, as a real potent space for organizing, which I think is, you know, so, so, um, topical all over, but I think especially in Ohio, because I know of the opioid crisis and the overdose crisis here, I think a lot, I mean, there, I think a lot about, wow, what would a radical union between drug users and harm reductionists and disabled people who really need our meds, who are being so policed from getting our meds, look like? Because, you know, and, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of organizing needs to be done, because I've heard a lot of people, I mean, I just heard someone the other day being like, well, I'm disabled, I'm not an addict, so it's really messed up that they won't give me my pain medication. And I was like, I hear what you're saying. I was like, you know what? Um, the idea of who's an addict or not is really socially constructed. A lot of people who are using criminalized forms of opioids are doing it because they have physical or mental disabilities. They're doing it because they're in pain, right? And a lot of them started getting it legally, and then it was like, oops, that's not possible. Right? I think that there's some real political power in mobilizing around organizing around pain. Like I have all these thoughts about like, wow, what would it be like if, chronic, if as chronically ill, non-opioid, um, criminalized opioid using people, we organize for safe injection sites and overdose prevention? Like what would it look like if we did that? What would it look like if we all had some kind of die-in at the doctor's office being like, I really actually do need my Tylenol 3s. Thank you very much. Um, what would it look like if we insisted that our knowledge around managing pain in all the ways that we do is much more valid than gatekeeping? What if we looked at all of the socioeconomic reasons that lead to people using in the first place, right? And what if we, I think that both as drug users, as chronically ill and disabled people, and as people who are both, we are so often seen as unreliable narrators to our own lives. We are seen as suspect. We are seen as people who have to prove that they know what they're talking about, but they don't really know anything. And I think it's really potent to actually insist in the fact that we all have human dignity and we all have so much skill and knowledge and power and to build with each other. Um, I know you said it was okay, but I'm gonna wrap up because I want you to talk too. Okay, so um, thanks for listening to me talk. Um, I hope this has been eye-opening. Um, okay, so I'm going to read a little bit from this piece called Still Dreaming Wild Disability Justice Dreams at the End of the World. Um, and I wrote this, some, back, some background. Um, so if people haven't checked out the Disability Visibility Project, you should. It's a really amazing media project created by Alice Wong, who's a disabled Asian American writer and activist. Um, to really amplify disabled culture and activism. And she published a piece of mine called Still, um, To Survive the Trumpocalypse, We Need Wild Disability Justice Dreams a couple years ago. And then she got a book deal and she's like, you wanna reprint it? I'm like, it's been reprinted a couple places. And she's like, well, why don't you write something about that's two years later? And I really had a hard time because I was like, God, two years ago was messed up. Man, it's really messed up now. And I was like, at the future? I don't know. And I was like, I live in Seattle and I was like, we're all scanning this guy to be like, is it going to be on fire again? And then I was like, oh no, the Amazon's on fire. Great. Okay. Um, but something I go to a lot that again is a form of disabled power and health and wealth and skill is the ability of disabled people that we manifest all the time to really dream wild ass, disabled, sick, crazy dreams and to make shit happen that able-bodied people might never see as possible. Um, 
So, okay, I'm not going to do the thing where you explain the poem and then it's a haiku, so I'm going to stop. But um, I'm just going to read a little bit from it. It's really hard to dream, and these are terrifying times. The nonstop repeated blunt force traumas of the last three years, the horrors that are often beyond the worst we could imagine that just keep coming and coming and coming, from the camps to the public charge rule, Kavanaugh's ascension to the Supreme Court to Muslim ban number three, forests on fire on all sides of the world and ice melting on, melting on both poles, have put so many people I know, including me, into a kind of deer in the headlights freeze state. The end of the world is easier to read about in a science fiction book than to actually deal with when it's happening. This past year, as I've been on tour with my book Care Work, I've often worn disabled queer Latinx maker Annie Eleni Segarra's The Future is Accessible t-shirt to my gigs. Often, I've asked people to stop, go inward, and try and imagine that future. I say this with the caveat that as disability justice movement workers, we know that access is just the first step. It is not actually what making a fully disabled future would look like, but it's a necessary one. But so often when I ask them to imagine that imaginary accessible future, let alone the disability justice future, they get stuck. The best they can ma imagine is maybe something not quite as bad as it is right now. But as disabled people, one of the biggest gifts is the dreams that we dream, and not in the inspiration porn imagination way of not letting disability stop us, but the small and huge underdocumented ways that we dream, dream, that we dream revolutions that range from me looking at myself in the mirror, disheveled and hurting with no shower on day five of a major pain break, and saying, you know what, I'm not going to hate myself today, to the ways that, we, that people that I don't even know on the internet raised $4,000 for my friend Dorian, a black trans survivor of police violence, currently a wheelchair user's wheelchair accessible van. We dream up ways of loving, fighting, and organizing that not even the most talented, able-bodied people could think of yet. And I would wager that one of the things that we, that we as disabled people are doing some of the most vital organizing in the face of peril, trauma, and fear of the world right now, specifically because we have specific disabled skills at holding trauma, organizing when things are terrifying, organizing when you only have 10 minutes of energy, but you do something with those 10 minutes. As I look at everything from Mask Oakland, a group of two disabled people giving out 80,000 breathing masks for free during the 2018 wildfires in California as city and state officials did nothing. As black disabled activist Dustin Gibson builds a disability justice library in a black neighborhood's public library in Pittsburgh that puts Audre Lorde next to Leroy Moore's books and throws out the Dewey Decibel system because they, it's colonial and they just wanna be in conversation. Um, and then some of the stuff is stuff I've talked about already. As it, but I just, you know what, okay, this is gonna be a ragged ending, but I'm gonna end there to say that we are people who are finding our ways to organize through peril, and in doing that, we are dreaming a liberatory future. And I don't know about health, but I do know that I want liberation. Thank you very much. So I work in social work, which is interesting because I'm not a social worker. I don't have a master's of social work. Um, and social work is this really interesting amorphous field that captures all sorts of other things. Um, does anybody here, social workers in your family, know about, so, right? Not a lot of folks. People are like, what the fuck is social work, right? The, um, the number of times my students get asked, particularly like over the holiday break, is like, are you going to steal people's children? Because uh, the assumption is that all social workers work in uh, child protective services or child welfare. Um, and that is certainly a, a small portion of the pie. Um, there's a lot of social workers uh, who do community organizing, collective activism, that type of work. There's social workers who do policy. Uh, there's social workers who do health. There's social workers who do um, mental health, interpersonal practice, all of those things. So social work kind of spans this gamut where it's interesting because we connect a lot of times to women and gender studies and to black and African studies. And as far as the organizing piece, we connect um, with education because we have school social workers and the stuff around that. So it's really interesting to think about health from the social work perspective, where social work is trying to do work that's grounded in social justice. And we also have a really problematic history in how social work was created um, around racism, around class, and around other things. Um, so when I work with other fields around health, I do a lot of work with public health, I do work with nursing, with medical folks. Um, and kind of to talk about what Leah talked about is how do we define health, right? And the CDC has that question that's like, how would you rank your overall health? Poor, fair, good, very good, or excellent? And as a disabled and chronically ill person myself, I'm always 
unsure how to answer that, right? And if I'm like, if I can't answer that, how are the people who are participating in my research supposed to answer that, right? Because I'm like, good health. Well, like, okay, and before the last month, I'm like, I'm in pretty good health. And I would answer it actually very good. And I'd be talking to my physical therapist who's like, you're in physical therapy three times a week. What do you mean your health is very good? I'm like, look, I'm in physical therapy three times a week, right? Like, I can get out of bed. I'm able to come here. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, you know, able to commit to this for my body. But their version of what is healthy and what is good um, is really challenging. Um, and so a lot of the work I've been doing um, kind of falls into two categories. I've been doing a lot of work around trans folks and access to health, which I think is really this foundational piece around gender and health. Right? Because when we think about gender, and I'm not sure if this is why you brought me, because when we think about gender, we tend to think about it in this binary, right, of men and women. But trans folks have abysmal access to health care and horrific treatment when they show up, right? And I use trans to be trans and gender diverse and non-binary and gender queer and agender and indigenous two-spirit folks, right? Everybody who is outside of what we define in this binary. Um, because providers are not prepared to handle trans folks in health, period. And they are certainly not prepared to handle disabled trans folks, right? People are showing up in the emergency room and getting misgendered and leaving, right? There have been historical cases within the past 10 to 15 years of trans folks being denied ambulatory, like ambulance emergency care and being left to die, right? This is not, so if this is, if this is not new to you, I'm sorry to, to bring it up again, and yet it's a truth that's happening. And so when we say gender, who's included in gender, right? The other area I'm doing a lot of things around is invisible or non-apparent disabilities, chronic illness, chronic pain, and these type of things, which is also really challenging because it's something that we think of um, as a women's issue, right? Women experience chronic pain, women experience chronic fatigue. First of all, women are not the only people that experience it. And then it crosses over again into that trans category. There are an incredible number of folks who experience chronic fatigue, who experience chronic pain, and who have this gendered piece where they're not falling into that easy category of being a woman, where we can say, oh yes, women experience chronic fatigue, experience chronic pain, but it's also not as simple as saying, you need to expand this to men. It's, it's blowing up these definitions. And so um, I did a piece recently that's, um, that's coming out this fall about troubling the binaries, because I think binaries don't serve us. Right? I think we are really obsessed in our culture with creating binaries, right? Are you cis or are you trans? There's no space in between. Are you a man or a woman? There's no space in between. Um, I wrote a piece recently um, called Twice Blessed about the invisibility of being a queer femme crip, right? Um, because are you disabled or are you non-disabled? Are you ill or are you not, right? And even spectrums, which we think are better, right? Like I've been doing this work for, for a time now. Spectrums are grounded in binaries. You cannot have a spectrum unless you have two ends, right? So even when we think, and I say we, or I'm, you know, I'm coming from social work and health, and we're like, yeah, we're doing, we're so much better. Look at this. We recognize there's a spectrum of gender. I'm like, great. So where do you put all the non-binary and agender folks? Well, well outside the spectrum. Well, what's outside the spectrum? Well, we don't know. I'm like, well, that's real helpful. And when we think about disability, right, this is something that came up in the, the class Leah and I spoke to this morning. So based on the US Census, 21.3% of adults in the United States identify as disabled or having a disability, okay? What does it mean to identify as having a disability and who is choosing to do that on the US Census? Does chronic illness count? Does mental health count? If I have cancer just right now, does that count? If it's 2010 and I have a broken leg, am I disabled even though I'm not going to be in 2011? Do I want the government to have a specific identification for me as disabled? I will tell you, as the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, my family is always like, the least amount of information that you can give to people, the better, right? So 21.3% does not feel like an accurate assessment 
of who has disability in this country, who identifies as disabled, who identifies as having this. And it gets us into these, these more of these constructs that are also troubled by binaries of what does it mean to be woman enough, to be trans enough, to be queer enough, to be disabled enough to hold on to these labels. And this is where the binaries strike again, is that we've created these boxes or these lovely spectrums, right? So much better than boxes where we're still saying, if you're here, then you count. And if you're not quite there, then you don't. So who do we lose in that? Because one of the best things about being queer, about being trans, about being disabled, about being any marginalized identity is the community that you build, right? When we look at marginalized groups, groups experiencing oppression, they are scrappy as fuck. Right, the slides that Leah just showed, like the amount of things that have been accomplished by small, quote, marginalized, quote, minority, however you want to frame it, groups organizing, right? It's a I'm Jewish, but David versus Goliath kind of story. It's in there somewhere, right? I don't know, I'm also agnostic. But it's because of community. And when we then put these parameters on what it means to be in a community, who are we losing? And how is that healthy? How do we create health not only for individuals, but for communal health, right? And I think that when I think about social justice and feminism and health and gender and disability and all of these other things is this is very, I'm tying it back to social work. I promise I'm coming full circle you have to look at it at the micro, meso, and macro level. And that is what is like foundational in social work, is you cannot look at an individual unless you also look at groups and unless you also look at systems, right? So let's say I'm doing work um, with a trans, chronically ill person, right? Well, yes, that one-on-one -on -one conversation with them about what do you need, how can I support you, can I connect you with resources, that's important. But also important is, what is in your community? What are these resources? And community doesn't have to be a physical community, right? The internet has completely revolutionized how we see community. Uh, before that, mail completely revolutionized how we see community. All right, so how do you interact? What does it look like to be in community? Are your medical providers in community or are they opposed to your community, right? And then systemically, right? We talk about, you know, talking about access to care everything from insurance and what does your insurance cover to type of insurance, right? When we look at class and how that intersects, what Medicare and Medicaid cover, right? The fact that Medicare, for folks who don't know, covers all gender-related um, stuff right now, but Medicaid is dependent state to state, right? And who gets to access that? So how do we look at all of these things, removing binaries, rem at all of these systemic levels. So what I propose in this, this piece that I put out there, because I'm a little bit of a Star Wars nerd, um, is a galactical approach to identity. And how do we say, all right, this is where my disability falls, this is where my chronic illness falls, maybe they're connected, maybe they're not, right? Because there's this other piece, um, around language, right? And you might have noticed I use people with disabilities and disabled people interchangeably. Because if you have two people of any identity group in a room, the likelihood that you have three ways to describe them is very high. So someone might say I'm disabled in some spaces. Someone might say I'm chronically ill in others. In other spaces, somebody's like, well, I have fibromyalgia, and I have migraines, and I have osteoarthritis, and I have MCAS, and this, right? Because those are the spaces in which that language means. And if we're on a spectrum, if we're in boxes, where do those three different things fall? And can I be the same person and hold all of those? But if we look at it from a three-dimensional or multi-dimensional galactical model, how can all of these pieces hold my truths? And they can also move like stars, right? And so today, it's like this. And tomorrow, maybe we're coming at it from this angle. And so then when we ask about something like health, health takes in all of these different constellations and also the position from which you're viewing the stars. And I would say that gender is the same, right? Um, this is a question I'm, I'm eyeballing, totally making this up. How many people in this room would say they identify as a woman? 
Okay. Are we all the same type of woman? Y'all, look around. Are we all the same type of woman? No, say something, y'all. This is like, right? We, to be a woman, to be a man, to be an NB, to be anything you identify as is a really individual thing. So the fact that we are taking, I'm gonna two thirds of this room and saying you all fit perfectly in this box or at least on this left side of the spectrum is it's simply wrong and not wrong in that I believe it to be wrong, but from a scientific thing, lens, view, epistemology, it's wrong, right? Thing, it's not helpful, right? And if we looked at other things in that way where we grouped everyone together, the way that we do around marginalization, it would simply not, right, like with a driver's test, driver's license test, right? Like mm, two thirds of you look like you might pass, so y'all pass. Would you wanna drive on the roads after that? Right? Doctors, two thirds of you in this room look like you could be a good doctor. You look good in a lab coat. You may all have MDs. Would that be a helpful way of looking at things? But that's what we do around gender, and that's what we do around disability, right? Even the idea that chronic illness, it's one of the least researched and least supported ways to be disabled or outside of this kind of non-disabled system, because it's easier for people to put it in a box than it is to engage on a one-on-one -on -one basis and say, you, what do you need from me as your provider? And you, what do you need? And you, what do you need, right? But that's that meso level. From a macro level, what would it look like if we completely reassessed the way that we view health systemically? And insurance wasn't something that had to be procured in order to seek out health. Um, I think about right now, I'm, I'm going through all sorts of fun, not fun at all, uh, changes in my health in the past six weeks. Um, and I have excellent insurance, right? University of Michigan, et cetera. I've been waiting two and a half years to see a neurologist. Uh, I flew for the first six months back to Colorado every three weeks. Uh, and now I've been driving an hour and a half to Jackson to see a neurologist. Um, so I finally was like, I'm gonna see a naturopath. Well, guess what my insurance doesn't cover? Naturopaths, right? What would it look like if we held health in that same way of removing binaries of this is health we believe in and this is health we don't? And to really move out of that spectrum, out of that space and to say, this is valid and this is valid and this is valid and you don't have to choose. What if we recognize the impact of community, of organization on health Right? And not just in a, we're gonna support, you know, put together a cancer support group here, but we're really going to invest in communities of support of one another in all ways, shapes, and forms, right? So I sit in this really interesting intersection of medicalized health and also radicalized health, um, and I embody it because I am somebody who is chronically ill. Right? And I am someone who is invisible often in both of these settings. Uh, what I talk about is, you know, if you didn't see me walk up with a cane, how many of you would have guessed I was disabled, not knowing the topic of this talk? Right? How many of you would have guessed that I'm queer, not seeing my pronoun pin? Right? So I, I have this privilege that I can go into spaces and shake things up. I can poke a lot of bears. And I also lose out on community, right? What does it look like to be in your own community and be invisible? I think about um, one of my partners who is now trans, uh, identifies as a trans man, but when we were first dating was uh, telling me about the gender queer head extension, right? Like they'd be walking down the street and be like, hey, right? And somebody would be like, hey. And I was like, oh yeah, I have never once in my life experienced that, right? And I think about now when I'm using my cane and I see someone who I visibly recognize because they're using some sort of aid, right? Or they have a, a logo on their laptop or something and I say, hey, now maybe I'll get a hey back, but if I'm not using my cane or I'm behind this podium and they don't see that, that's not there because we've created these really complex ideas about what does it mean to be 
disabled or not? What does it mean to be queer or not? What does it mean to be any of these things? And so um, I have no idea where I am on time. I'm checking in. Okay, we're doing okay. Um, is totally just lost my train of thought. Welcome to the cog fog I'm dealing with. Coming back around. Nope, I need a hint. Can somebody give me where I was? Oh. Oh, yeah. So what was we were talking about? Thank you. Um, in class this, uh, this morning is when we talk about pronouns and asking pronouns, what do we tell people? Don't assume, ask everyone. Ask everyone, tell everyone, right? You cannot assume by how someone looks, how they identify, correct? If this is news to you, please take this home, right? You cannot assume how someone identifies based on how they look. So what would it look like if we did that everywhere? If we held space for people's authentic selves to show up? I have friends who are folks of color who are white passing. And we have convert, yeah, right? You feel like, yes, me, I win, right? Or, but it's, and you don't, right? And it's this, this challenge of there's that wonderful space where you're like, yes, I can speak up in a way that maybe other members of my community can't, but what do you lose? What are you missing, right? And so if we move away from these binaries where we're asking everybody to choose one or the other, this side or that side, right? Or somewhere in the middle, because that's the only other option. What would it look like? So that's, that's kind of my question as a whole. I actually really want to talk about spoon theory, if you don't mind me piggybacking on that, um, because spoon theory changed my life, right? I think I'm a pretty smart person, right? Like I'm like, okay, I, you know, I engage with lots of different people. I come up with, with interesting ideas. Um, and it wasn't until I learned about spoons that I started learning from my community about disability and how to best engage with myself. So this idea of spoon theory was created by Christine Miserando. You can find it all in but you don't sick look, but you don't look sick .com. And the concept of it is Christine was a, has lupus and she's in a diner in New Jersey. Anybody here from New Jersey? Yeah, you're like, yeah, New Jersey, right? So for those of you who have not been to New Jersey, they are full of 24-hour diners, and every diner has a napkin and a spoon out. Not a full silverware, napkin and spoon. I know this, I lived in Philly. I don't, no, no, napkin, spoon, napkin, spoon. Yes, right, like, yeah, you have to order, so I don't know if they just expect everybody to get milkshakes or what the plan is around that, but that is what they have. So Christine is sitting with her friend, and her friend is saying, you know, I want to, understand what it means to have lupus, right? Like, I hear you saying this. Like, I know that, like, I believe you. I believe that it's a real thing. But I see someone who is in a wheelchair, and I don't expect them to go stand and run down the block, right? Like, I know on some level what to expect. I see someone who is using um, a service animal that says guide dog, and I don't expect them to read the menu that's put in front of them, right? I know I have some ideas. But what the fuck is lupus? How do I engage with that? And Christine thought, and she gathered up all the spoons and made a bouquet of spoons, right? And she said, all right, here's where I start. Now this is what my interpretation of it. I have a whole spiel I do for my class. So I have spoons. Morning you wake up, hop in the shower. Do I just take a quick rinse off or even just wipe down with some wipes so I'm fresh? One spoon. Or do I wash, I do my hair, maybe I even blow dry it and put on some makeup that takes four spoons. Time to go to work. Do I do the environmentally friendly thing? I hop on the bus or the light rail, um, but it's cheaper. I don't have to house a car, all of these things, uh, but I have to walk there to start with. Then maybe nobody gives me a seat because I don't look disabled, right? Then I get there, then I have to walk to the building and I'll, you know, if it's raining or snowing, like, uh, but like let's let five or six spoons, okay? Um, or I take my car. It's real expensive, right? I have a car payment, I have insurance payment. I'm on the highway for an hour and a half. I have to pay, you know, parking garage fees, but it only takes two spoons, right? Goes through the whole day, does this thing, it's lunchtime. Do I want to be social with my coworkers? Do I want to go out and get lunch with them, connect with people? But there's the walking there and back. There's the standing and waiting until we get sat. We have to find a place that can handle my food allergies, right? Then I have the emotional labor of trying to grill the, the server to be like, is it actually cross-contamination free or is it just, okay? 
Well, that's like seven spoons. Or I can heat up leftovers but by myself in the break room, or I'll just eat at my desk because it's no biggie. And that's one spoon. Finishes the day, all of these spoons flying here and there at the very end of the day and has two spoons left. All right, do I go home and you know, I'm home now? Do I heat up a TV dinner, sit on the couch and watch whatever's on Netflix and go to bed? That only takes one spoon. It means I actually have an extra spoon to start the day with tomorrow. Or do I actually do something with my partner that feels really affirming? I don't know, maybe we go to mini golf or we have sex or even we just cook together. That actually takes three spoons and I'm having to pull one spoon from tomorrow already. So I start tomorrow at one spoon left. Friend's like, okay, I kind of get it. And then she's like, and that's a good day, right? That's a day where I feel good. I know what my body is like. It's functioning the way that I'm used to it functioning. That's not in the middle of a flare. That's not when it's raining outside. That's not when I've run out of my medication or we're trying a new medication or I have to go off of all of my medication for a month until we can try a new medication, right? So as Leah was saying, a lot of people identify with the term spoonies. Um, when I do this with my classes, sometimes people are like, um, I prefer hit points. You know, those are the folks that play D&D. Um, or they say like a cell phone battery charge, right? You know, like I'm at 10%, I'm at 5%, that type of thing. Um, and they say, you know, but it's like the old phones where you can never get your phone to fully charge, right? And I say this because, because gender is a piece at play around chronic illness. Women and feminine presenting people are significantly less likely to get any sort of diagnosis or support for years at a time than their masculine presenting counterparts, years. Um, for a long time, things like chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, fibromyalgia, were just categorized as a quote, women's illness from being too tired from like actually trying to work and have a family, right? So even how we have defined illness is gendered. But I think about what it means to be a teacher, right? Which general teaching is thought of as more women's work, although in the academy that's certainly debatable. Um, and it wasn't until I started talking about spoons to people that some people in my community were like, why do you stand up to teach? Why do you do that? And I was like, because that's what teachers do, right? But is it? And I was like, what would it look like if I sat down to teach? Would my students not listen to me anymore? Would they even be able to see me? I don't know. I mean, I went through this whole list of reasons. And someone in my spooning group who was an adjunct at the same school was like, just try it one day. Just try it. And it changed my life. Because what was happening is I would teach a class and then I would go sit in my office and cry for about an hour until I could work up enough spoons to go back to my car to drive home. And now I only cry for about 20 minutes before I can work up enough spoons to drive home. And that to me is very good on the health. Crying for 20 minutes, fantastic. But can you imagine if I told this story to my doctor? Well, you should maybe stop doing that, right? Um, so it was from my community, once I was able to find this identity space, and talk to people who have that shared peace and who even though they had different experiences, different illnesses, different pain levels, different all of these things, and had been saying this the whole time, I was not ready to listen, right? Because we have these preconceived notions. And the other day I put up something on Facebook and I said, Spoonies, what are the hacks that you have to get through your life, right? Hacks like you don't have to shower every day, it's really okay. It is okay to go out in leggings and yoga pants and nobody will care. Things like that, this whole list, probably 70 people responded. And then someone responded, you know, for you these are spoony hacks, but for me these are single mom hacks. And it took me a moment to think about how much pressure we place on gender and performance and ability and how it's all connected around. So I want to be able to get to our conversation, um, but I really wanted to share the spoony piece with you because it's something that can be used around mental health. It's something that can be used around fatigue. It's something that can be used around pain. It is not something that you have to be 100% in on your disabled identity to use. 
but it is one of the most helpful things. I started using it with sexuality clients I would see and simply changing the conversation to, I would love to, and I'm running low on spoons. Could we do something else intimate tonight? Versus I'm sorry, I'm not in the mood, or I'm sorry, not tonight. That tiny tweak was enough to save relationships, and it saved my career.